Um, welcome, my name is Kayla Isabel and I am the CEO here at Startup Canada. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am on today is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of all indigenous peoples of this country. I encourage each and every one of you to take a moment now to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are residing on today. Over the month of March, in celebration of International Women's Day, uh, Startup Canada, startup communities, and leading women entrepreneurs, government, industry partners, all of our different stakeholders have come together to celebrate the contributions and achievements of women entrepreneurs in the Canadian economy. And we don't just do this for a day. We do it for the entire month of March, celebrating these incredible contributions um, and supporting women through all of our various programs. Um, over the past year, uh, we, you know, we've seen selling online become even more essential for Canadian businesses, and it's really creating new opportunities for business growth um, and boosting resilience, very importantly, during, you know, where we find ourselves with COVID-19. So today, we are so excited to present Building Your E-Commerce Business Tips from Entrepreneurs and Experts. Whether you already have some e-commerce experience, you're dabbling, um, or you're looking to start selling online, this webinar is going to provide you with expert insights uh, that you need to grow your online sales and understand what questions you need to be asking yourselves. A few quick housekeeping items. Um, please use the chat function throughout the entire conversation. We will be having a Q&A at the very end. Um, so I'll be compiling those questions throughout, um, but you can use the, the uh, chat function by clicking panelists and attendees to share that information uh, through that space. Um, we also will be recording this session, so it will be distributed afterwards, but we will not be sharing uh, the exact PowerPoint presentations used here. We'll have uh, various tools and resources provided in the follow-up email, um, so you will be receiving uh, some guides and additional tools. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our co-presenting partners of our Startup Women program, Sovereign Insurance and BDC, as well as our national partners, UPS, Scotiabank, Inniskillen, PayPal, and EDC for making Startup Women a possibility. So thank you to those incredible partners. Uh, without further ado, let's kick things off. Um, I am absolutely honored to introduce our expert speaker who's going to be doing about a 10 minute presentation for us, Sarah Skirfield, um, who's the Commerce Marketing Lead at Google. An e-commerce marketer at Google, she works with global commerce partners to bring the best of Google services to entrepreneurs and SMBs. Sarah has been at Google for 10 years, and in her prior Google roles, she's worked with a large client sales team, heading up relationships with global retailers like Walmart, Home Depot, and Hudson's Bay. Prior to Google, Sarah ran digital marketing for an e-commerce site at Arcadia Group, um, the owners of Topshop and Top Man in London, UK. Sarah brings over 15 years of digital and retail experience to her partners and prides herself on being a trusted advisor within the changing digital landscape. Changing digital landscape, understatement of the day, I think. <laughs> so with that, Sarah, I'm going to turn the digital stage over to you to say a quick hello, and I will give the presentation a go. Over to you, Sarah. Great. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here today. Um, that was quite the intro. I think the net net is my job now is to interpret all of the resources and tools that are available in the e-commerce space at Google. And I'm going to really try and focus on that today for, for businesses of all sizes. So I'm really excited to see, you know, who's starting out and who's more mature in their business cycle right now. And um, I was talking to, I, I happen to live with an entrepreneur and was asking my partner, um, you know, what would be the most helpful. So I'm going to really focus on that today. Just some like quick, he says, like quick, fast hits of things that will be helpful for this group. So looking forward to it. Kayla, you can um, switch right to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, um, oh, interesting, I can just see Kayla, but okay, so what I wanted to talk to you about today, you know, the pandemic has been a crazy period of time. I firstly want to acknowledge it hasn't been an easy time for, for most of us, I would say, but if I put my e-commerce hat, it has been a, a time of tremendous opportunity. Um, we have seen stratospheric growth in this space, and if I look at, uh, I love this quote from one of our partner CEOs who said, 2030 came in 2020. And so it's it's interesting to look at what's been happening in this space in e-commerce during this time. Next slide, Kayla. 
And I, I love this stat. I think it just, to me, puts it in perspective. This is a stat from Canada Post on a, you know, a, a random Monday in April, April 20th, 2020. Um, 1.8 million packages were delivered in Canada. And to put that in context, that's more than we see in the holiday season. So you know, many of you might have experienced this where you were planning for that typical retail big holiday season and you saw these record breaking days that were happening well before that. So you can imagine what kind of scramble ensued after that. And I'm sure the, these containers in the background weren't far off from what Canada Post was seeing as they scrambled to get all of our packages delivered. Um, and then I, I wanted to share a couple of stats from Google. So we've been keeping um, some research studies going over the last year. And I think from an entrepreneurial perspective, there's these are a few key ones to think about. So one, um, you might know this from being a consumer, but Canadian expectations have been high for a really long time. We're really big adopters of technology. We have high expectations. I think part of the problem is we weren't able to get what we wanted in the e-commerce space before the last few years. And so we anticipate that this will continue post pandemic. We're gonna see an uptick in e-commerce that continues and continues to grow. So even if you're just starting to dabble in this space, you haven't missed the boat by any stretch. Um, the second piece is that this is a time of opportunity for, for new brands. So if you even think about your own behavior, a lot of disruption has happened. You're redefining what your new normal is. Um, and so if you're a new brand, 30% of Canadians are changing up what they've used in the past. Great opportunity. And then finally, um, I say this to all e-commerce merchants, but in Canada, free shipping is table stakes. Over you know, two thirds of Canadians are saying now um, they only shop with free shipping. So when you're starting out, really think about how you can incorporate that into your business model and make it work for you. Cause I know it's really challenging, but it certainly is something that's more and more expected. Okay, so for the rest of the time, I, um, I'm gonna focus on a lot of tools that I use with my partners that are free and accessible to startups. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, Kayla, I've outlined how I've categorized them. And, and just so you know, you don't have to write feverishly because Kayla's gonna send out a handout afterwards, but I'm gonna highlight the ones and how I use them in particular, just give you my inside view to this. So it's all about mining for trends. And then also we have a, a tool that helps you do a website audit or a health audit that can be very useful. The third piece is about going global. And then finally, once you're up and live, how do you get discovered? So if you go to the next slide, Kayla, um, I wanted to start out by telling a story. We all have these stories over the past year. Um, but if you think about, there was a huge run on yeast at the beginning of the pandemic. Everybody had time on their hands. They were trying to figure out how to bake uh, you know, fill their time. So we started to see a lot of searches for, for yeast. Great. Yeast ran out. A lot of businesses got really entrepreneurial in this space. You saw, you know, your local brewery that would drop off a six pack of beer and also some yeast, which is apparently a byproduct of, of what they do. So a lot of creativity in this space. And then sourdough became a thing as people tried to make bread without yeast. Um, and then when I was going in for this presentation, I was looking at what else was popping during this time. So if you look at yeast and sourdough, another big trend was banana bread. And if you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. You don't need yeast to make banana bread. You can still scratch that itch about becoming a baker um, without all of the toiling with yeast and making your own yeast. So why I go into this story is that the way that I like to use Google Trends, which is probably a tool we've all used before, is to prove out hunches. So if you go in cold to Google Trends and try and figure out what the next big thing is, chances are you're not gonna have a lot of luck. But if you have a couple of hunches that you're trying to prove, it can be a really powerful tool to help you understand you know, what is the next trend in turmeric or something like that, um, to use one of the other panelists' examples. Um, the other way that I like to use this tool is as a crystal ball. So if you think about what Google Trends is from Google, it's, it's a database of intentions on search, right? And so um, if we take the pandemic as an example, Italy went into lockdown before Canada. So what was popping in Italy um, in let's say, let's call it like February or March, that can be a really good indication of what's gonna happen in Canada. So oftentimes I will go into Google Trends and I'll look at the UK, the US, Italy, whatever other countries, see what's rising in those countries and then apply them to my home market and whatever that might be. So that's another good trick with Google Trends and how to use it. 
And then finally, I talked about how Google Trends is a database of intentions for search. We also have included another tool now that's less well known called Rising Retail Categories. And that is a consolidation of all our shopping searches. And so it's people that are in Google looking for specific products. And what we've done is surface dashboards and I think we're almost up to 10 countries now where you can see what are the rising trends in retail. Um, so it's just, a, it's a fun one to visit and also really helpful if you run an e-commerce site. Next slide, Kayla, thanks. Okay, um, in Canada, we launched a new tool uh, a few months ago called Grow My Store. Um, what Grow My Store is, is it's a tool to essentially give you a health audit for your website. So if you have a, a website that's e-commerce enabled or not at this point, you can go in, put your URL into the tool, and it will give you a really thorough analysis of the health of your site. And when I talk about the health, I'm talking about things like, um, what's your mobile speed like? Do you have to make improvements there? Um, do you have any products on your site? Are they well labeled? Are your images labeled? So not only will this help you with your SEO, but it will also help you with all of your marketing and being discovered in general. Um, so I would highly recommend you to manage this tool. I think you can submit it to a, an email, send it to your team, however you need to use it, but it's free and available in Canada now. Okay, and then and the next tool I have for you, I'm gonna start with a story. Um, there is a business in Canada, a startup actually, that does tattoos. I think they're called, I wanna say Ink. For some reason I'm blanking on the name. I'll, I'll put it in the chat when I remember it. And they started off in Canada and they make synthetic tattoos or temporary tattoos. And why I bring them up is because when they started their business, although they're based in Canada, they are very much a global company. And surprisingly, one of their biggest markets is Japan because there's some type of insight around Japan and tattoos and not wanting to get permanent tattoos. And so the idea of these temporary tattoos really resonated in that market. And why I'm telling you this is that I would really encourage you to think about being situated in Canada, but from an e-commerce perspective, you don't have to be a Canadian market only company. Um, and Google has a new tool that launched called Market Finder. What it will allow you to do is put in your website into the tool and it will give you an evaluation of where there is the most opportunity for you to either expand or to grow your business on a lot of different components. It can be about the categories that you're in, the competition in a Google auction, um, fulfillment and payment types, all of this different information. So it's a really good foundational tool to help you get started with your import export strategy or just to become more of a global e-commerce business. Inkbox, thank you, Catherine. That's exactly it. I don't know why I blanked on that. Um, what a great crowd here. And then uh, another one is, you know, it's like the league of your own. If you build it, they will come. That's certainly not the case for e-commerce businesses. Um, I work closely recently with a company called Peppermint Cycling Company. They're out of Montreal. They make cycling apparel for women. During the pandemic, they had to switch from a bricks and mortar strategy to be purely e-commerce at this point. Um, and one thing they took full advantage of was um, using a native integration with Google on their site builder. So they work particularly with Shopify. You can go in, download an app with Shopify that's free, and it allows you to access two different products with Google. One is called free listings, and then the other one is called smart shopping. And then the other huge benefit it has is you don't have to create a product feed for your e-commerce site. Um, what it does is it will scrape your Shopify site, create the feed for you and upload your product catalog to Google. That gives you access to a lot more tools with Google. Um, the one that I'm most excited about right now is the launch that happened globally in, I think it was April timing where we launched free listings. Essentially what that means is you're eligible to, for your product to show up for free on across a ton of different services at Google, including shopping. Um, it's a really good way to, to get started in the Google space if you haven't dipped your toes in advertising. Um, but Peppermint Cycling also uses something called smart shopping. So what they do is through the Shopify integration, they're able to put in a budget, a daily budget, and then there's no other action needed. And the system goes out and it finds them as much revenue as possible for that budget. Um, currently, I think they get it between a four and a five return for that investment. So it's a, it's a really structured and clear way to make sure that you're getting a return that makes sense for their business. Um, so those are two good 
um, tools from a Google perspective if you're just getting started in the e-commerce space or if you want to, you've got your site all set and you're ready to take the next step in terms of discoverability. And then finally, there is this tremendous program going on in Canada only right now called DMS Shop Here, powered by Google. The, the summary of the program is that there is a mission across the community to get 50,000 Canadian businesses online and e-commerce enabled. Um, the program has hired up, I think it's 1,500 students across Canada and train them on both the Shopify and Squarespace based website systems and they're building websites for businesses for free in Canada. Um, you can go on the site and sign up. They will not only help you build the site, they'll train you on it and they will also train you on the basics of Google products. So things like your business profile, which is essentially a new an, another window into um, your customers um, and all of the other Google products that are available. So it's a really good way to dip your toes into um, into e-commerce. Uh, so, and that's all Kayla, thank you so much. So that, those are my top tricks. I think um, it's a lot to absorb right off the bat. So I'm happy to send out that one pager after and then take questions during the panel. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. I learned a tremendous amount in, in that, that short period of time. Um, and Angela has been um, including a number of the resources in the chat function that you can click through. And we will, we will be sending through more information in the follow up um, space as well. Uh, quickly, before we jump into our panel, Sarah, one question about Grow My Store. Is it relevant to businesses that sell services online or just product based businesses? It's, it's relevant to both. Both. Fantastic. So hopefully that's helpful uh, to, to our audience member. Wonderful, Sarah. So I will now ask all of our fabulous panelists to hop on um, with, with their screens um, and we'll kick off some introductions. Hello. So I'm delighted to introduce our three panelists um, for the next 35 minutes or so, and then we'll jump into additional Q&A. Uh, we have Dakota Brandt, Kelly Stewart, um, and Marissa Bronfman. Dakota Brandt is from Sapling and Flint um, from Six Nations of the Grand River. Brandt graduated an AGF fellow from the University of British Columbia with a master's degree in community planning. She's been a frequent contributor to national media outlets um, and uh, is uh, an incredible CEO of Sapling and Flint, a jewelry manufacturer specializing in gold and sterling silver. Sapling and Flint is online, ships worldwide, retails in New York, Ontario, and Quebec, uh, and has a flagship location um, in Osagan. Uh, welcome, Dakota. We have Kelly Stewart here from Sampler as well. Kelly is the Vice President of Marketing at Sampler, one of the company's earliest employees. With almost a decade of experience in brand strategy and communications for consumer packaged goods, Kelly joined Sampler to help build the team's marketing foundation. Since joining Sampler, Kelly has developed um, and implemented Sampler's B2B to C brand voice through the creation of, and amplification of digital content. She's played an integral role in helping Sampler win industry awards, including a canny last year, uh, which has applications open. Um, and she's also the co-founder of Retail TO, the newest event series within the Tech TO family. Retail TO focuses on bringing together Toronto's retail community to discuss top trends and innovations within the industry. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we have Marissa Bronfman from Shot of Gold. Marissa is the founder and CEO of Shot of Gold Superfoods and the founder of We Are Women, a national nonprofit that just launched on International Women's Day. You may have seen a purple box um, <laughs> scoping the internet uh, in celebration of IWD. Uh, which is a national nonprofit that supports and empowers Black, Indigenous, LGBTQ2S+, and women of color uh, food entrepreneurs in the food and beverage industry in Canada. Um, she helps them build pandemic-proof digital first businesses. She's lived in Mumbai, India for six years, and that's where she started her two first businesses, digital media and plant-based foods. Um, and she's launched two initiative, initiatives for Indian women, um, learned how to speak Hindi and ate delicious food almost every single day. I'm incredibly jealous, <laughs> hoping we get to travel soon. Um, after starting her career in media in New York City, um, Marissa now lives in Toronto and is passionate about building a brighter future for women at the intersection of food, wellness, and entrepreneurship. Holy moly, 
What a panel. I'm so, so grateful to have all of you here today. Um, and let's let's dive in with some questions. Um, so kicking things off, Kelly, let's let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about Sampler. Talk to us about your business. When did it launch? What was the inception story? Um, and talk to us about your online sales strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so Sampler started in 2013. So we've been around for a little while now. Um, and it really came out of the concept of, um, I mean, we're all quite familiar with traditional forms of sampling where you're walking down the street and somebody hands you a, a sample. Um, it's probably not relevant to what your preferences are. Um, I know I've had that before. I've had men's razor handed to me. Um, the reality is a lot of these things get thrown out, which is super inefficient for brands um, and inefficient for the consumer. So really uh, what we wanted to focus on was building a solution that made for a better experience, more personalized experience for both the brand and the consumer. Um, so our technology uh, actually matches consumers with samples um, that fit their profile. So they answer questions, tell us about themselves, what they like, what they don't like, any dietary restrictions, um, you know, skin type, hair type, all those things. Um, and we ensure that we curate a list specific to them uh, of, of samples that, that suit the answers that they've given. So um, once again, it makes for a much better experience for both the brand and the consumer. Um, and really we've done a lot of stuff around e-commerce, around kind of boosting the e-commerce experience for um, many, many brands, um, everything from emerging brands all the way up to um, L'Oreal, helping them kind of personalize their e-com experience. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's it's a really interesting space because there's always so many different pain points that are really unique to each and every brand. Um, and we're just one piece of that puzzle. Fabulous. Thank you, Kelly. And Sampler is my dream. I love samples so much. And so it's been such a, a pleasure just to get connected to, with, with Sampler in general, but incredible to see the work and the growth uh, that you've had. So congratulations. Thank Dakota, you. over to you unmute myself here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Dakota Brandt. Um, I'm a member of the Mohawk Nation Turtle Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Um, that's where I am here today with my business. And um, along with my twin sister, I'm the co-founder of Sapling and Flint. Um, I serve as our CEO. And um, we started in about, we started as a as a hobby in 2014, but went, <laughs> but went rebranded and went full time in 2017 when we finally had to decide our, to ourselves was this just a hobby or was it something that we wanted to really pursue? So um, we, we pursued it. And so Sapling Flint today is a 100% um, Indigenous women owned jewelry manufacturer. We specialize in gold and sterling silver products. And um, we manufacture everything here on in Six Nations of the Grand River. And um, I'm here in my gallery today, in the office in the office space. And um, because of COVID, our our gallery's been shut down for almost a year now. And um, but um, we still do curbside pickup locally. But um, all of our products are available worldwide um, online um, through our you know saplingflint.ca. Our Facebook is shoppable. Our Instagram is, shop is shoppable. All that fun stuff. And I'm glad he to be here today because COVID was really, a, from the beginning, we were an e-commerce um, business. We knew that from the, from the start because um, the, the fact is First Nations communities are some of the most socially and economically isolated places in the country. And if we wanted to be able to be successful business owners here, we had to be online. And so that's where our customers meet us for the, for the most part. It's where we turn a lot of our customers first time customers into lifelong patrons. And that's what we hope to do. Um, that's the experience we hope to have for all of our customers. And, um, but COVID has really been um, an opportunity for us to put to the test the things that we knew uh, about e-commerce and the things that we didn't know we didn't know. And those are the things that I hope to share a bit more about today. That's a great, yeah, it, I think it's definitely showcased to us. <laughs> we now know what we did not know before. And, and just these questions, um, I think it's so helpful just to watch the journeys of the entrepreneurs that we have on these panels, um, because you don't know what you don't know, especially when it comes to e-commerce space, if, if you're navigating this the first time. So thank you, Dakota. And there's going to be so many questions coming your way soon. Uh, Marissa, over to you. Last, but certainly not least. <laughs> thank you, Kayla. Um, such a pleasure to be here with everyone. I love being around smart, successful women. This is so cool. Um, last year, more than a year ago now, I was working on my own small business, Shot of Gold. 
and uh, you know everyone's favorite punchline, COVID happened. And so everything I had been planning for my business was no longer relevant. And um, I knew, however, that people would need turmeric now more than ever. It's nature's most powerful anti-inflammatory. We're in a pandemic, how do I make this happen? And I started chatting with other women in the food and beverage industry, women especially who I knew had restaurants, government had closed them down. They were trying to pivot, you know, do I offer pantry? How do we club delivery? And in having these conversations, I said, oh my God, we as women never talk about how hard it is to be women entrepreneurs. And we always put on a brave face and a smile. We never ask for help. These things weren't working for us before, and they certainly won't work for us during a pandemic. And so I started an interview series called Women Supporting Women in Food. We started offering mentorships and grants to women. We have this incredible community. And um, I thought, you know, we have the possibility here to have much greater impact and take this national. And so that was the inspiration for We Are Women. Uh, like Kayla said, a not-for-profit that launched on International Women's Day. And we are exclusively trying to help women build pandemic-proof digital-first businesses. So, you know, COVID or no COVID, how do you go directly to your consumer and have success? Uh, one of our, we just announced our first mentorship and grant opportunity and our first mentor, uh, Tamara Wensley, she has 400 times online sales during uh, the pandemic. She's an indigenous woman based in uh, Vancouver Island and has totally taken advantage of the opportunity. And so that's such a perfect example of what we're trying to do and uh, really excited to talk more about that. Fantastic. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. So back over to you, Kelly. Walk us through how COVID-19 impacted Sampler and the consumers that you also support, like the, the overall business structure of Sampler. Was this a great opportunity or, or did this pivot really um, challenge you and your team early days? Yeah, uh, we're, we were extremely fortunate because it's we've been building the digital sampling space for many years now and we were one of the first ones in the space um, and to be honest the first you know five years of our business was just explaining to people what digital sampling was it wasn't really a concept that was known um, and there are a whole bunch of challenges that come with that of, of kind of trying to define and coin the term and get people to start searching for it and understanding the benefit of it um, everyone was really relying on traditional sampling and so uh, we had started to see a shift a few years ago um, but last March, everything changed. All, all of the people that had started to understand what digital sampling was, all the brands, um, overnight, all of their Costco sampling closed or um, any initiatives they had of event-based sampling, sampling at music festivals, everything was gone. And sampling is such a massive piece um, in you know, getting the product into the hands of consumers and such a massive piece of the CPG space um, that you know, they had to do it, it couldn't stop. And so uh, luckily for Sampler, uh, honestly, our, our business essentially tripled overnight, um, which became something very interesting. And then on the other, it was a very unique situation that on the other side of things, consumers felt safest at home. So what we do is we deliver the products right to the doorstep of consumers um, and we only give them what they ask for, that they have to self-select and opt in to get the products. Um, and it just so happens that it's a time right now where I think we can all attest to this here uh, in the e-com space that getting a delivery to your door is like the best part of your day because there's nothing really else to do, um, no matter how big or small or whatever it is. Um, so it was one of those really unique situations where both sides of the business really benefited from it, um, which is amazing and really validated our space. And so what's been great about it is all these brands that we're working with now are now seeing in the way that you would have shifted from traditional advertising to digital advertising 20 years ago, um, they're seeing that you can get that same kind of data um, and, and a richer experience as a brand, um, more insights and, and more trackability and measurability through a digital sampling solution than you would have if you were handing out uh, free perfume samples in a department store. So um, it's been quite interesting. And uh, we do a lot of consumer on the B2C side of the business. We do a lot of consumer uh, trend reports and everything. And uh, we've been closely kind of monitoring the sentiment of consumers um, going in store and they just don't feel comfortable with it. And that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Um, Ecom seems to be, you know, here to stay. And so it's, it's been a very, very interesting year where again, extremely fortunate um, on, on our side of things that it's really validated our space. But um, yeah, it's been interesting working with all these brands that again have had to really completely pivot their strategy overnight. 
Thanks for sharing that, Kelly. And to Sarah's point earlier, you know, with 30% of, of consumers open to trying new brands, this is, you know, a beautiful moment to sample and to experiment and, you know, to be um, trying all, all these different new things within the comfort of your own home. So interesting to see that uh, that coming together on all of your stakeholder sides. Mm -hmm. um, Dakota, walk us through. So you mentioned that you know you were e-commerce from the very beginning because you were trying to connect, um, you know, with Indigenous women across Canada already. Um, how did you balance the brick and mortar and the e-commerce and the the sort of shift COVID um, threw at you at last March? Um, I knew when COVID initially had impacted everybody that. Um, that I knew there was going to be something in terms of growth for our business, but I just did not expect the level of growth that would take place just because everybody who, everybody who was on the fence about shopping online was starting to move over to that e-commerce experience, right? Um, the big thing for me initially, though, was just the province-wide shutdowns, the mandatory shutdowns of non-essential businesses that were taking place, not in terms of impacting my business, but my, but my, uh, my suppliers. So um, we are metallurgists. We need to have access to, to our suppliers. Um, the entire like, fat, like jewelers district was essentially shut down in Toronto. So I had no real, in, um, real access to even to like metallurgist stock exchange, like, like metal exchanges there as well. Um, and then also <laughs> um, Donald Trump didn't help either when he decided to, you know, I don't know if you guys remember the news in the summertime where he was blocking just an enormous amount of funding for USPS. So my being able to ship and also I we we had a great um small supplier for um for chains for a lot of our pendants in but they were in the in on the state side and so we were waiting two months for supplies and I immediately was just trying to find any supplier possible to try to just get chains for us um for to you know to be able to create our product and so there was the big scramble with COVID from my end was um was being able to maintain stock, you know, we were lucky that we we already had we already had a lot of material on hand, but that was material that we were saving up for. Or we were, you know, we we're planning in advance for our Black Friday season, holiday season. So by the time even September comes around, where a lot of businesses are okay, okay, we're solidifying, we're figuring out what our holiday season marketing strategy, what our products are going to be, what are going to be pushed during the holiday season, what sales we're going to have for Black Friday. We were sold out of everything. We had nothing because e-commerce was blew up so much, but we just didn't, we were, we were looking at, we were using our stock from that was supposed to be for, you know, the future. And we were using that to survive at the time. And so essentially what ended up happening for us was um, once the, the lockdowns, ha um, like, you know, they ended again and businesses started to pick up. Luckily in August for us, we ended up having to hire extra help just to keep up knowing that we were going to be struggling by Black Friday, which was scary for us knowing that there's so much opportunity there. There's so much potential there for growth, but we were hitting Black Friday, Friday sales growth in July, August. And so we eventually, we essentially had to blow up, like we were a smaller company where we're thinking, you know, we do plan ahead, you know, three, four months in advance, but now we know permanently that we're going to have to be thinking at least six months in advance now, um, which, you know, is, which is impacting even like how much more hiring we got to do. Just knowing that like, you know, this is, if these, if these sales, if these sales, this sales growth is going to continue, we're not going back to pre COVID shop line, shopping experiences. I know it's not the worst problem to have. I'll put it. I'll put it at the end of the day. It sounds like a struggle, and and and, it, and it's something that any every entrepreneur struggles with. Or in terms of all the all the problems and the troubleshooting you have to do, um, make sure that you're taking the time to um, flip the switch and realize that you know having more business isn't the worst problem to have. <laughs> to remember that you that um, some problem problem problems mean that your business is growing. You know you wouldn't have a lot of problems if you weren't growing. You know, and so growing pains is what we were going through at the time. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Growing pains and that that hockey stick moment that so many very, very small businesses, um, you know, are, are now put in these these different types of challenges. You know, it is, you know, a great opportunity, uh, also incredibly stressful. And, and you know, we've seen that as particularly with women entrepreneurs um, taking on these additional responsibilities with growing businesses or struggling businesses 
and additional demand at home, you know, domestic responsibilities, et cetera. We're seeing this, this challenge uniquely with women entrepreneurs in particular over the last year. Um, so it's, it's multifaceted and, and, you know, incredible to see that type of growth, but kudos that, you know, it is a tremendous amount of work and you're, you're learning um, completely new uh, parts of the business in real time. So that, that still uh, is a, is a huge challenge, but congratulations, Dakota. That's great to hear <laughs> overall about the growth. Uh, Marissa, talk us through, uh, you know, your journey through COVID-19 and protect, particularly on um, uh, both business sides. So with, with your turmeric business and also with um, the new business line during the COVID, launching a business during the pandemic, um, how has e-commerce sort of supported both of those journeys? Thank you for asking. Also, I just want to apologize. I did not realize there is a fire alarm test going on in my condo right now. So it might be over, but I'm not sure. Let's just say that women, women owned businesses are on fire. That is the wink from the universe. <laughs> um, you know, so many interesting things have happened. One, um, I'm so grateful. And this panel is an example. COVID gave me the chance to connect with so many women entrepreneurs in my city, in my province, in this country. Um, and I always say, you know, stronger together, collaboration, not competition. Um, I have collaborated with so many women for my business, Shot of Gold. Um, we've done, you know, giveaways, Insta promotions. We've also had really powerful conversations in those giveaways. Last summer, um, five women-owned CPG brands came together and we talked about women's menstrual health and tried to really break down stereotypes. And of course, sales are often um, a result of, of Instagram activations, but they're also really important conversations to have. Um, I also, interestingly enough, as we talk about e-commerce, had so many physical retail opportunities open up that I had never pursued or never thought of. Just because we were having these conversations, I was meeting these women digitally, um, and so there was more word of mouth. And so I think that will be true for other businesses, especially in the food and beverage industry, which is, which is mine and also the focus of We Are Women. Um, you know, I think e-commerce is, is, should be most people's number one strategy, but retail also can be a huge driver of growth and revenue and can also support your e-commerce efforts. If you're on shelves, there's this level of trust for the consumer. They're comfortable to buy you online because they know there's buy-in from grocery. Um, so that's definitely been true for Shot of Gold. I've seen that for other women's businesses as well. Um, we are women. We've just started, uh, as you know, we just launched, but, um, you know, of all the women who were involved in the box, we had 15 black indigenous LGBTQ2S plus and women of color represented. They have all taken advantage of e-commerce, social media, talking to each other, seeing what they can do together. Um, so, so amazing, amazing opportunities. Definitely lots of growing pains as well, like Dakota mentioned, uh, learning on the go and some days are completely overwhelming. And, and uh, what can I say? It's the new world that we live in, but overall, very exciting. Lots of opportunity for women entrepreneurs online. Fabulous. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, so I, I would love to jump into, you know, some really practical questions talking about tools and platforms. And, uh, you know, I think these spaces are so inspiring and I definitely have received my dose of inspiration. Uh, but what women entrepreneurs often ask for is like the nitty gritty, like just talk to me about the actual how um, so that they can really visualize how to use these supports. Um, so Dakota, maybe we'll go back to you. What are your, um, your key platforms where you sell online? How did you choose them? Um, have there been any learning or growing pains in those platforms um, that could help inform some of the women entrepreneurs listening now? Um, oh man, we've been through, through a couple of different um, ways in terms of how I sell um, online. So I had already, I'm not, how do I say this? Like a web designer, but you know, when there's lots of op, op, op platforms out there like GoDaddy, Wix, Shopify, um, where they where they're able to help you set up and be creative with the way you want your 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 site to look, um, those kind of tools are amazing and to pursue them um, in any any means you like. And so I had kind of worked with those kind of platforms already before I was I had already started Sapling and Flint with my with my twin sister. So like back in 2015, we had started our own. We had started under a different brand name. We 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 called ourselves selves Twindian Designs. Because it was funny, I'm like, oh, we're native and we're twins, and <laughs> so it, so it was kind of like funny at the time, and we wanted to use it, and so, but we we start, I started a platform using Wix um, back then, and it was um, and so like it was fun hobby. We did have a website, we were selling to people, but at the time we we're like, if we're really really gonna pursue this, 
you know, let's rebrand. <laughs> let's do it. Let, let's think about our, our brand face a little bit more. We switched to Sapling and Flint, which still honors our traditions because Sapling and Flint, Nigorunda Zenox are so we scared out there, the names of the of uh, of the creators and our creation story and their twin boys. And so um, so we wanted to keep that, you know, that, that twin kind of connection in our name. And so we carried that on. And so from there, it's always been kind of just being on top of what apps work for you um, and working from there. Um, we now use Shopify and I switched over to Shopify maybe about, about two years, over two years ago, I think, because um, I don't know if you've ever heard of, a, there's a pitch, there's a pitch company called um, Power Pitch, or there's a business competition called Power Pitch is located in Ottawa. So um, at the time we had, we had pitched in and we won the competition. But they also had mentorship happening with people like a uh, member with um with a Shopify team. And so I actually got to meet Shopify um, people that were part of like, judging and being mentors for the event. And, you know, they made the platform seem exciting to me. And when we subscribed to we from there um, subscribed to Shopify. And the big point that I'm, I want to make about that experience was that um, Shopify of any other platform was the one that was really interested in me understanding how to you how to use and navigate their system. Um, you can do a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship if you look for the right places. Shopify, you know, like pre-COVID was always doing like classes at their headquarters in Toronto. So I've been there a few times just to find different, just to just to learn from the experts, you know, different strategies on how to how to optimize the use of your website, the tools that Shopify has. And um, we think that when we have these gigantic corporations like PayPal, even even Startup Canada, a lot of us think of them, of them as like, like a really big national 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 brand. Um, you would be surprised if you reach out the kind of one on one experience that you can actually get even with these conglomerates that just seem to be massive. You know, so we have a great working relationship with partners at PayPal. Um, we've all we've had them from Shopify from the very beginning. And even PayPal is, um, you know, uh, uh, is a sponsor of start this event today. And, um, and to me, it's always been that um, the big thing about corporations and working with them and trying to find platforms that work for you is understand that when you do better, they're the, the, the um, success of a large company, a transaction POS company or an e-commerce retail platform, their success is based on your success. So they, it matters to them that you do well, that you are able to understand their, their platforms. And so trying to find the tools that they, that they put out there so that you can grow in terms of your own expertise. Um, my big advice was to make sure that you're, you know, you're going with the ones that do Matt, that do make sure that care about your business, that make sure that you understand their tools, you know? And so um, that's kind of a big one that I would put out there in terms of just like what happened with our own e-commerce success. So I did like have a little bit of um, platform experience, you know, like hobby making websites, that kind of thing. And it just like I having our own going full-time forced me to grow my own expertise. So I'm always, I'm always growing always learning, um, always remaking or re reinventing how our brand looks to people. That's another one too, is when you come from a brick and mortar experience as a business, um, the best way to envision how you would go into the e-commerce experience is that um, how would you, how do, what kind of experience does your customer have when they come into your brick and mortar business? What kind of, how do you want them to feel? What's their perception of your brand? You know, even what kind of music you listen to, what's the light, what's the kind of lighting that you have in your business, like all those little things that make what make or what make your business what you like about it. You need to be able to transform that experience into a digital one. And that's what you need to do with your with your online platform. How can I take the brick and mortar experience, not just in terms of the transaction itself, but how do how do people um find out about your product when they're on your website are the are you answering the questions that you think that they would want that they are asking what questions do you think are they asking do you understand what your customer understands about your business when they look at your website you know all of those things that you can take care of readily easily just by having face to face and brick and mortar you got to be able to translate that over into a digital version version and those kind of and the tools out there that are going to help you do that um, those are the tools that you need to focus on mm, and I'll I love stop that. right there yeah. 
and just the values that was a lot of fantastic content amazing um and and just that values alignment that you know in corporate partners that you're engaging with with your own you know experience that you're providing to your customers um i love that that is so core to sapling and flint and that's something that really serves entrepreneurs um uh, when when you feel that that the business has a heart and has you know these emotional elements um it resonates much more with the, the consumer community um kelly i know you've used many tools with the many different hats that, that you've worn um within sampler and beyond walk us through some of your favorite ones and why they've helped you um and and potentially your customers as well yeah i mean i think for, for any business, first and foremost, you need an amazing CRM. You need something, some sort of platform that ensures that you're tracking how your customers are interacting with your website and your products, um, who your repeat customers are, and really who your brand ambassadors are, um, and, and a way to reach them, right? So having a really strong CRM tool that allows allows you to engage with them, whether it be through email, SMS, um, web push, any of those things, I think it's super vital. Um, on top of that, uh, one that I've just been watching recently as a consumer that I am obsessed with is, I don't know if everybody is using Shop Pay, um, but that app that uh, basically saves your payment information. And there are a lot of um, emerging brands that use this now on their e-com platform where you can just click that purple button and pay. And then in the app on your phone, it uh, basically curates the entire list of any purchases you've made through Shop Pay and gives you amazing updates about fulfillment. Um, I think fulfillment's been a huge piece of the last year. Um, some, you know, as businesses, we can try to control, some we can't. Um, but I think uh, anything like that, that's giving really great transparency um, in kind of that post-purchase journey of the product to your front door is invaluable. Um, and also just reducing the friction of, of, of purchasing, right? Like if I know that I have to um, create an entire profile and then put in my payment information and then like it's this whole big thing and I just want to buy a product, I'm probably going to take that time to think like, eh, is this really worth it? But if there's a very easy way for me to, for the transaction to happen, um, it, it makes for a way, way better uh, consumer experience. So uh, Shop Pay is just an interesting one that I've been looking at right now. But yeah, as a whole, for sure, um, CRM. And then also right now, I think anything to do with SEO is super important. Um, I, I mean, the, 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 the ad world, the social ads world is uh, just so saturated right now. So another angle you can take if you maybe don't have um, the budget to keep um, spending on ads and bidding against thousands and thousands of other companies for the same audience is really upping your SEO game. It's a long play. Um, but it, it can really, really help in the long run um, and it's worth the time and effort. So there are some really great tools like SEM Rush uh, that are a great investment and really help guide you through that process and make suggestions for you. Um, and so it's a really great place to start if, if you aren't super familiar with SEO and SEM as well. Fantastic. Lots and lots of, of practical tools and advice. Um, and we're going to be jumping into our Q&A uh, and inviting Sarah back into the conversation. So to our audience, um, you're welcome to, to jump in uh, your questions. Um, just quickly, uh, that's a great question. Some of those terms, um, Kelly, can you just go uh, through CRM, SEO, SEM, um, do a quick run through of those. So that's a I'm fit. sorry about that. I should have done that right at the beginning. So okay. CRM, uh, customer relationship management. So it's a platform where you can basically have um, the contact information of every person that's ever bought from you or sign up for your newsletter, anything like that. Um, and you can essentially track their activity. So you can see if you sent them an email, did they open it? Did they click it? What have they bought from your site? What pages have they viewed? All those kinds of things. Um, there's a range of tools and their sophistication, um, but getting a really good one and investing in a good one is going to be kind of the, the heart of your business and a really, really important tool at that. SEO is search engine optimization. So it's really about making sure you have um, the keywords that people search for when looking for your product. Um, whether that, you know, is a specific food or what have you, um, and, and putting that into your, sprinkling that into your website strategically so that when people search for you, you pop up higher in Google um, than, than you would without any, you know, search engine optimization on your website. Um, and then SEM is search engine marketing. So, um, you know, Google ads, for example, um, investing in some advertising there can go a lot far, further right now than potentially investing in social ads. Both are important. Um, but as I said, uh, the acquisition game right now and, and trying to acquire someone through social media is um, very saturated and very, very expensive. 
Um, and so sometimes you're better off taking those dollars and investing them in other places that, um, you know, are obviously all digital channels are overwhelmed right now, but you might have a better shot at getting in front of the right people um, for, for less money, essentially. It's more bang for your buck. Hope that helps. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. That, that's great. Uh, and I see a number of questions coming in. So I'll, I'll start going through and then Marissa, we can, uh, can jump back to you. Um, a question on building a, or running an e-commerce business from another country coming to Canada. Um, Sarah, if we, we bring you back into the fold with our panelists, do you have any advice with um, you know, potential clients that you've worked with who are straddling that shift coming from an international space into the Canadian market? Do you have any pieces of advice that, that could be helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think the nice thing about being an e-commerce based business is, although you're headquartered somewhere, it doesn't mean that that has to be your only market. Um, and so I would really think about product fit, where you want to go. I talked about the tool Market Finder. That's a really good place to start if you've, you're already established. If you're not, maybe find some websites that are similar to the website that you're thinking of making and run them through that tool just to get a feel for, um, for market fit. Uh, but I would say overall, you have way less limitations when working in e-commerce. The other piece is I'll go back to Dakota's advice about working with your site builders. Oftentimes, they'll have either extensions or applications that will help you process multiple currencies, multiple types of fulfillment, and they can be really useful as you look at, at globalizing your business. Great, great uh, comment question. Um, in terms of biggest mistakes, so are there any big lessons that any of you would like to share, potentially some hiccups that you came across along the way uh, that you wish, you know, hindsight obviously being 2020 that, that you had recognized before? Um, does anybody have any lessons learned they would want to share with our entrepreneurs or any kind of failures that helped propel you and uh, uh, move you forward? Sure, I, I, the one for me, um, it, especially as a marketer, is it's easy to put the cart before the horse and want to um, essentially drive traffic to your e-com uh, or to your website before you've really perfected that e-com experience. Um, and you really only have you know, that first impression that's so important. Um, you're better off taking a little bit longer to really make sure that your e-com experience is, is where you want it to be um, and something that's really easy to navigate, really accessible, um, and really, you know, informative and, and leaves an impression before you, once again, you know, put, invest those dollars in those ad, those ads, or even take the time to, uh, you know, build up that social following and push them, push the traffic to your site, make sure you're, you're proud of what you're pushing them to essentially. I love that. Be proud of what you're pushing people to. That's a good little, little zinger. That's a tweetable moment. Um, do you think that there is any value in going with a marketing agency? So looking at, you know, bringing in consultant support or additional support um, to help you grow your online brand faster and then allowing it to grow organically. Dakota and Marissa, do you have any feedback on that or potentially Sarah within the groups that you've worked with? Um, what's your approach with contracting out? I haven't contracted out but I want to, and I'm interested in that answer. If anybody else has the experience. <laughs> awesome. Marissa, what are your thoughts? Um, sure. I'll say a few things, some learnings. Um, I think Sarah's comment about free shipping, so important. Work it into your business plan. It's make or break. Kelly's comment about ensuring you have a good e-com experience. I absolutely could have done better at that. And uh, I think it's something that's really important. Everyone obviously just wants to get online right away. Great advice there. Um, another thing that I would say uh, that's been a learning is things are changing so quickly, you really want to stay on top of things. So for example, I, I did work with an outside marketer um, and there was a struggle because Facebook and Instagram changed their integration with Shopify, changed their online shopping. So what was really easy before, like you see an Instagram post, shop the post, then behind the scenes became very difficult. And then it becomes difficult for third party people to help you as well. Um, so in hindsight, and it can be so overwhelming as an entrepreneur, especially if you're alone in your business, there's so many things to stay on top of, um, but you really want to because then down the road when certain platforms or apps change, um, it can be very difficult and expensive to, uh, to get back on top of things. 
Mm, great comment, Marissa. Um, looking at another question, I'm starting up my online business and I'd love to hear more about approaching shipping and the options there are for small businesses. I've got some answers for you, Angela, but I'll let the panelists uh, provide their insights. Where do you get shipping support? What, um, what shipping services do you use? Um, Dakota, maybe let's start with you. Um, one of the reasons I, why I like to use Shopify or switched over with my own business is just those things are so well integrated into your business are in big, like Shopify designed their, the, the, you know, the back office experience so that you can be centralized in terms of how you upload to your channels, um, where, um, selecting your shipping options, even setting it up so that you have your product and that you can, you can set it up already. So you can just have it you know, it's, it's already integrated and ready to go where you know how much your product is going to weigh in terms of the, the ship, you know, the shipping. And um, I did invest into, um, you know, like a printing label, but like printing labels, a printing machine for, you know, labels for stickering for all my products, but it's, um, um, but I bought them through, through the Shopify store. So they already have ones that they recommend for their, for like when you're uploading labels from them. And um, so like I did it by myself before, before, like when I was still kind of doing it as a hobby initially, I did spend the spend the money after that just to buy the la the labels because once I had them, I'm like, oh, I can't imagine going back and just handwriting or create or typing up all the individual labels. It's just so labor intensive at the end of the day that it was it's just which things do you have time to do? You know, I have so many things to do in a day, like um, but but using a platform like Shopify where they do give it the options to your customers like how much do you want to pay for shipping and how fast and so they they get that option from their end and all i got to do is print the label from my end and it just it's it's added up to just so much time savings in the day, in the end of the day for me plus plus it just makes your packaging that much more professional looking that um the, the labels and the custom forms that you can print right off um right from right from processing your your the orders as they come in Fantastic. Thank you, Dakota. And I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in. So um, Kelly and, and Marissa, do you want to answer this very quickly? And then I've got a question for Sarah. So Kelly, over to you. Around fulfillment. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So um, we actually, so we have our own fulfillment houses. We've got one in um, Pickering called CFNR and they're incredible. Um, and it took us a long time to find one that we really liked, right? Because you, again, they have to, you know, um, it, it's better when for us anyways, when it was, um, a fulfillment house where you could put a face to a name. Um, you could talk to someone, um, they can grow with you um, and really, you know, understand that your needs right now may be very, very different five years from now. Um, and so that's been really, really nice to have. Um, and yeah, they're called CFNR. Um, and so we also have one in the US called Ship Fusion, same thing. Um, just making sure that you have a really strong relationship with them so that you can stay on top of things. Uh, I would say in the last six months, especially, Fulfillment obviously has been a huge pain point and challenge for everyone. Um, and so it was really important that we had that line of communication with the fulfillment house to tell us how delayed things were going to be, especially back in fall when everything's a bit of a mess. Um, so we can then communicate to the consumers um, and set expectations and everything like that. So I would say either um, I, other outside of that, I don't have specific names, but um, definitely something important about the fulfillment house is having that relationship either for them to tell us to tell our consumers or a platform that keeps your consumers um, in, involved when about the delays, right? So um, there were a lot of pain points for me as a consumer uh, throughout that experience where I would buy something online as a present for, for the holidays and it would be like six weeks later and I've had no update, no one's telling me anything. Um, so I think, you know, whoever you pick, whatever you go with, make sure there's some form of line of communication back to you or back to the customer um, to keep them in loop and have transparency around the delivery date and process and everything. I'll add another thing, another point too, is that um, like Canada Post is my, is my, um, you know, my shipping choice when people come on. And a, a big part of that is um, that Canada Post is my local post office. Like um, that's a big part of it is like, a, like I'm there every single day dropping off orders. And so, you know, one thing it's eliminated the amount of time it takes for me to have to take them in and get that, that all sorted out. The fact that I can just ship print off shipping labels because it's already part of my platform. So that saves time. But the other one too, is just the one-on-one -on -one relationship that I can have with Canada Post because the post office is literally in the same plaza as my, my gallery. And so when I go in there, they tell me, 
oh, here's the deadlines for holiday shopping. Like they give me the card for it or just like, like they, cause they, they have that one-on-one -on -one with me. So they know enough to know when I come in, this is somebody whose business is online. And so if there's any, anything coming down the line that I need to know about, they, like a lot of times I end up just learning just from, just from the employees and staff, cause I've gotten to know them at, in my local post office. And um, so Shopify integrates Canada Post into, into my, into my, you know, back office shipping options anyway, but the, like I have so much value for the face-to-face, -face. like I, even when I was mentioning before, just about Shopify and PayPal and using them as, as, as platforms, um, it's the same thing with Canada Post. And it might not be Canada Post for everybody, like some of you, it might be very convenient to go to FedEx or UPS or, or to any kind of op, any kind of other options that, that exist out there. For me, I live on a reserve, you know, the, the closest thing to FedEx we have is 40 minutes away, you know, um, Canada Post is my, is the option here for, you know, in rural Canada, you know, in smaller communities. And so consider that a lot too, um, when, um, when you are when you are um, dealing with your with your shipping is just like what kind of relationship you can have with businesses like it's just been really helpful and I just want to point out too. that's a great point to go like the yeah. face opportunity yeah fantastic and so I, I see that we're at time so we'll just squeeze in one final question um, over to Sarah um, when is the right time to actually build an online store um, when do you um, do that as opposed to just selling on social media or just having social media accounts when do you think is the the right time for somebody to build an online store I wish I had a silver bullet we could end on there I think I saw lots of comments in the chat about sales channels so that might be an interesting topic altogether like when do you go into Amazon and how to use marketplaces and Instagram shops and all of these new um, tools. And, and so I think it will depend on your business and the origin story of your business too, right? Like if, if you start out as a creator and you already have a really big following, it will be a very different business model than if you started out as a bricks and mortar. Um, but you know what, I think whatever you do, it goes back to what Kelly talked about is like, you want to own your own customer. You don't want to have to pay or rent your customers through other channels. So it is important to think about how you can get that foundation right first and really invest in that upfront. Fantastic. And I know we're, we're two minutes over and I want to thank everyone so much. Thank you, Kelly, Sarah, Dakota, and Marissa for spending uh, your afternoons with us today or mornings um, and sharing such incredible insights. This has been super practical, also very inspiring. Um, and to everyone in the audience, this, this topic uh, will be gone through in, in much more detail through our Startup Global um, program, which will be launching June 1st of this year. So we're going to be getting into this nitty gritty, looking at fulfillment, looking at these different relationships you can can build with partners like Google, like UPS, um, all of these different groups like the Trade Commissioner and EDC as well, so that you can build globally competitive businesses. Um, to Sarah's point earlier, think local, but you know, scale globally. And there's these tremendous opportunities with e-commerce in that space. So we will be doing more, more there. Uh, my colleague Angela is going to pop up a quick survey before everybody hops off so we can get some feedback from you um, and make sure that we're supporting you from Startup Canada in the best way that we can. Um, and we also have a bit of exciting news to share from some of our partners at um, Elevate. Elevate and Moneris have now launched Canada's first e-commerce accelerator, e-commerce North. Um, so if you are looking to engage with a proper cohort to go through building an e-commerce um, an e-commerce site and business, this is a great opportunity to take your startup to the next level, get the help from industry experts, resources, and build a community of like-minded founders. Um, so Angela is going to pop the, uh, the URL in the chat, and we'll also be sending this through in the follow-up email. We'll have Sarah's fantastic go-to guide of all all the different resources she talked about earlier um, and we'll continue to share that out over the next couple of months um, and thank you again to our partners sovereign and vdc as well as ups scotia bank inniskill and paypal and edc my goodness all the wonderful partners that make start of women a possibility we could not do this without you um, thank you all for spending your time learning um, and everything will be sent up in a follow-up email so you can expect some additional details there have a great rest of your day, everyone. Uh, thank you to our panelists and good luck. We're here to support you in every way we can. Um, and uh, this journey is gonna be challenging, but, uh, but fruitful. Um, so we're, we're here to support you in every way. Have a great day, everybody.